LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and my guest today is Phil Escott. From the New Age movement to the 2012 phenomenon, and across the spectrum of belief that is contemporary spirituality, in recent decades there has been a lot of talk about awakening. But just what is it, and how do you get there? Exploring Eastern mysticism? Meditating on a mountaintop? Becoming a hermit, hiding in the woods? It could be any, or all of these, but also none. What if awakening is nothing like you've been led to believe? Like the ordeal of transformation through trauma, awakening can be difficult, unexpected and at first even unrecognised. Although sometimes sudden, it can also be slow and often more subtle than expected. It may even take place at the moment of your death, but it is always incomplete. Typical traits such as the dissolution of desire and the death of ego may not transpire and the hoped for end of human faults and frailties may be an illusion. In the quest for an answer, the mystery only deepens, and the esoteric elements of all this will, for the time being, likely remain meaningless and irrelevant to most. We remain prisoners to fear and resistance, unwilling to grasp the vast totality of that which is always there. But in the end, whatever the truth, should such a thing exist, the fact that you are a sense organ of the infinite, and that the universe is waking up through you, remains undimmed. Hello and welcome, Phil, and thank you so much for joining us again on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be asked back, Greg. Thank you very much. Uh, Phil, today we're doing something of a follow-up to a previous interview that you and I did. Uh, during that, we discussed a book that you'd published called Arthritis, The Best Thing That Ever Happened to Me. The title itself, quite intriguing. It took us into a lot of very interesting areas about um, wellness and health, uh, both body and mind. And we, towards the end of that interview, we started to touch upon the idea of exploring the mind-body connection a little bit further with regard to the idea of an awakening, uh, which meant for many people is a spiritual thing of some dimension or other. And there's a lot more really we can explore in that. So before we get started today, just tell listeners who are coming to this for the first time and they don't know just a little bit about who you are, what you've done and your work, and then talk about, just get us started by talking about your experience of awakening, what it has meant to you, or just your general thoughts on its significance. Sure. Well, um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a drummer and a, a writer. I've done a lot of uh, writing for different sort of health and mountain bike magazines over the years, that kind of thing. I ran a gym. Um, I've done all sorts of, of strange things, but um, m most of my life, my main interest, I guess, was spirituality and just finding out our essential nature. Everything, everything I've done has been kind of geared to that, whether it, it was from being immersed in the whole TM, Transcendental Meditation Movement, to years ago taking tons of hallucinogenics. It was never really a... Um, a recreation it was it was more of an exploration of exactly where the mind could be opened up to and even after decades of of, of being a what i consider a bit of a yogi and uh, moving up to the north of england here to skelmersdale where um where the tm center is of, of, of england you know and just just thinking i'd I, I even kind of, it was 1986, I thought, well, I'll, I'll even give up playing music. I didn't in the end. I found a lot of music up here. But um, I, I decided that I'd, I'd just become a yogi for the rest of my life. And that, that was a phase that was, that was wonderful. It was, it was great. But strangely, the thing that brought me to the realization that I'd always been seeking was 
a moment of completely letting go of all spirituality. And then, that was probably around 2005, 2006, where I had the whole of the whole of the universe kind of shifted for me while staying in exactly the same place. But there it was, and I didn't have any questions anymore, if you like. But then nature had a lot of questions for me, so it kicked me in the teeth quite a bit, and uh, and and I got very sick with um, psoriatic arthritis, which is the inflammatory autoimmune thing, basically rheumatoid arthritis in 2010, and had to fix that. And it was very very grounding and, and very opening at the same time, more so even than any spiritual practice for stabilizing that awakening. Um, quite often, if you have these kind of awakenings, they can leave you in a, in a state of, uh, of some confusion afterwards, even if you, you feel you've prepared your whole life for it because it's never quite what you imagine. That's one of the most common things I hear people say. It was nothing like I imagined it would be. And and so, yes, the illness, I think it, it took me into some great places. It, it uh, yeah, it, it grounded it, really, which is, is very important because we can't live in that sort of spaced out uh, state for forever. We have to be, as the old cartoon goes, where the, the, the monk is, is, is in the marketplace on his donkey or whatever, and then he goes up into the mountains and he's there for years and gets enlightened and then the last frame is he's back on the donkey in the marketplace you know it's it, it, it's it's nothing all that special which is a weird thing to say about it since everybody sort of uh, everybody in the spiritual world um craves it so much of course it is the paradoxical thing is that it is the most special thing ever but it isn't the bells and whistles that people imagine it is okay well I don't know if uh, if anyone who feels that they don't understand a concept of awakening or uh, what, how that might be real for them or for anyone else, if they ever ask you, well, what does awakening mean? Is it some kind of new age thing? If I was asked that, I would say, well, it would perhaps be a dawning, as in literally an awakening, for a, an individual that the world uh, or reality, um, how they thought it was, and their relationship to it and maybe their relationship to others wasn't what they thought it was, uh, whether it's just a little bit different or whether it's wholly different. And it usually leads them to an expanded view of themselves and wider reality. Now, what all that means in fact, in detail, we can get into that, but that's loosely how I would characterize it. It's just this kind of like, whoa, okay, this is much wider, deeper if you see what I mean, more than I thought it was. And that doesn't necessarily, there's no value judgment there, as you pointed out yourself, not necessarily good or bad. It might be good, bad, and different and all of that. It's just more than, than was there before. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I, well, what happened to me was I was in the back garden at, at the previous house I lived in, and it was a house that I bought in 2003, and it was 2005 or six by then. And I'd been back on the dome site, which is um, the there's a dome shaped building where, where everybody goes and meditates and does their yogic flying and whatever morning and evening. And I'd been totally into that in the 80s and early 90s. And I, I thought I was back on the dome site and I, I was 100 yards from the dome. I can just walk there in the morning and evening. And yet I just didn't feel like going in. And I had this sort of religious guilt almost of like people who don't go to church. And I was thinking, oh, I really should go in or I should go in. I was thinking it every day. But my heart wasn't in it anymore, even though it had been the thing I'd been the most interested in. And at one point in the back garden, I was sick of these thoughts. And I just went, do you know what? I've had enough. Absolutely had enough. I obviously i am not into it anymore. Let's just completely let go of that whole personality. And for some reason, I actually did it. Like quite often we sort of wish that we could do something like that with many different different uh, problems in our lives. But I just let go. And and in that moment, there was the, everything completely changed. What it was, it, it again, it's impossible to put into words what it exactly was. But um, I, I think everybody who's had this experience, um, it's not really an experience, but has tried to explain it and failed miserably. But there are a few things since 
that I've seen other people. None of these are unique to me, but there are some things that seem to make a lot of sense. And when I think about them, I wonder why people don't sort, don't see it. You know, they don't just sort of suddenly pop through when they have these few things explained. But I wouldn't have done. I wouldn't have done. It, 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 I think it's just a matter of grace in the end, or, or it's just complete surrender or something. It's very difficult to tell. But what it's like is when you're completely wrapped up in a film, um, you're, you're wrapped up in the characters, the, the plot, you're excited, you're frightened, and then suddenly the projector breaks and there's a white screen. Oh, okay. You know, there's the screen. There, there's it, it was all being projected on it. It was just an illusion, and it's like seeing the screen. Then oh, the projections can start again, but you're always aware of the screen. You know, the screen's there. You're not fooled anymore, if you like. But the very best way of explaining it, I think, is to is to think about a dream. When you're dreaming. You're walking around. You see dogs. You see chickens. You see people. You see cars. You have uh, experiences. You talk to people. All of these things are going on. You get chased by zombies. Whatever's going on. But who are those chickens and cars and zombies? Well, they're you. They're they're all in the dream state, and they're you. Although you're reacting to them at the same time. Well, when you can realise that. As in lucid dreaming, which I think after these awakenings becomes very common. A lot of time you 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 dream, you have these lucid dreams, but um, so that's what it's like in everyday life. That is what it's like. It's not so much that it's all your personal imagination. In fact, there's some illusion that there is. A, it's actually possible for a human being to wake up. I don't think it is. I, I, it's, it doesn't work like that. That's the misconception that spiritual people have, always striving for an awakening. It's not like that. It's like the universe kind of wakes up through you. So the whole stream of what's going on is almost like it's pouring in the back of your head and out the front. It's not. It's not centered in your mind, in your brain. You're no longer the center of the universe. You're just. A sense organ of the infinite. That's a lovely expression, I think, because it's more. We are more like eyes and ears than we are separate entities, and it just doesn't make any sense to people. They cannot grasp it. The mind can't grasp it. When I was a kid, I used to have these experiences. I used to be sitting in class, and I'd go, "Ah, ah, oh," and it was gone. It was just a fleeting experience of what I used to call the everything all at once. And the mind can't can't comprehend it when it's gone.、Um, if it's a fleeting little drop into it, but when when it sticks, when it really sticks, it it's extraordinary. It's it's like everything's exactly the same, and you're you're you. I I, I just do exactly the same things as I always did, although I have a completely different view on them because it's not really me having the view of them as such. It's like some people describe it as the dissolution of the ego. It's not. It's it's like looking at a cloud through a telescope, and then you take the telescope away, and the cloud really isn't that big. There's all this blue sky around it, so you can see much more of the totality of things. You or you, it's not so much you see them and experience this massive vastness or anything, because the vastness was already there in front of you. And you were searching and searching. I think I actually said it in the last interview. The the the, the, the analogy of a fish swimming around in the sea looking for the water, and and that's that's the sense of this this endless drive of the, of the spiritual person to to gain this enlightenment, and as if it's some prize, where it's really just realizing exactly what's going on. But it's so subtle. It's so so subtle. Beautiful things come out of it. You do end up with an awful lot more compassion. You don't take things so seriously. You, you, you have less fear of of of, of everything really—death, illness, anything like that. I think I got through that illness and had the courage to go all the different ways that I did to discover ways out because I wasn't so panicked by it as maybe somebody else might have been, or I certainly would have been ten years previously. So、uh, it has its uses, of course, but. The ego is dissolved only to the extent that 
th that you're aware of a much bigger perspective than the ego that you previously had, but it's still there. It's it's both and. It's not one or the other. Two things popped into my head there. One is like this idea of this larger reality, if you want to put it like that, always being there, recalls Huxley's reducing valve. You know, the idea that the form of consciousness that we experience most of the time is deliberately, whatever that implies, limited. Otherwise, we'd if we were exposed to this everything all at once, it would be utterly overwhelming. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that sometimes we glean little hints of it, don't we? A sense that there that it's there's something beyond what we're experiencing. Sometimes these just little tantalizing hints is all we can really cope with. And the, the other regarding the ego is you're right. It's it's not the dissolution of the ego because the ego is actually necessary, uh, as far as I see it, to kind of function in in this sort of three D reality that we find ourselves in. And um, it, but it's more a case of coming to a point where you be come aware of the ego very much as like, ah, there it is, that it's not you or it's not the entirety of you, but it's an aspect of you. It's very useful and very necessary, but it isn't everything. Yes, yes. I I, the, I like the, the Huxley thing. It's, it's, um, it's true. If you have a, a brush with it, sometimes it can seem like a frightening thing, which is why people resist and maybe step back. I, I, um, I took an awful lot of hallucinogenics back in sort of 1979, 1980. That's the only time I did them. But I did an awful lot, you know, like a huge mushroom season in Wales with 900 a day and that kind of thing. And it's, well, previous to that, I'd had one completely beautiful God experience on LSD. And then the second trip was a bad one. And after that, it was, even though I went into the experiments with it, it was, it was teetering a bit. I, I kept resisting. I wasn't surrendering, and this ingrained the 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 lesson. Well, the ability to resist everything to hypochondria is resistance. You know, you're always worried about your health. Or you're resisting. Oh God, I've got this twinge. I've got this. Instead of oh, good, interesting twinge. What's that telling me about my emotions? Because the body's an instrument panel, the mind body connection. So we panic, we freak out, oh, I've got this thing, I've got that thing. And I spent my whole life like that. And I believe it was the root cause of the autoimmunity. It was the, it was the uh, resisting awakenings, if you like. And what Huxley's going on about there, I think, is that if people are shown it, it's not that it's exactly overwhelming in itself, it's that they are overwhelmed by it because the ego, when we get so used to living in that tiny room, we become like somebody institutionalized in a prison. They get scared of being released. And it, it can be a huge, overwhelming experience if, if you don't completely surrender into it. If you completely surrender into it, it's the most natural thing in the world. It's almost like there are these traps set around it, these traps of... of, of um, either fear or even bliss, because I think a lot of people get wrapped up in the bliss and they, and, and they say, I had, oh, I had this beautiful, blissful meditation. Oh, it was wonderful. It was, and, and then you get these spiritual people who, who are obsessed with the bliss and the experience. And this happened and I had this great experience of the universe and I saw Krishna and all of this sort of thing. Well, to me, I, one of those great masters in Saga Data or something, I think once said, well, is it still there? Well, it wasn't that then, was it? You know, it, it, the, the thing that they're looking for is something that's there all the time, has been there all the time, and always will be there because it's our essential nature. And then it becomes almost, there, there's, a, there's a, a waking down movement in the States called waking down. Um, it's a, it got some quite good teachings. And I remember somebody who had been there saying, when he was talking to the guy who's the head of it, I forget his name now, he's quite a cool guy, but anyway, and he said, be prepared for the disappointment of awakening. <laughs> and I thought that was lovely because it is, it is so subtle, but you have to, you, you have to really accept the paradox of everything. It, it's, I'm stumbling at my speech, I'm usually quite fluent, but it's by the nature of the subject is so difficult to put into words. You have to kind of hedge around it like, 
like sort of rubbing, doing a brass rubbing or something and getting the, the, the pattern through onto the tracing paper because you can't directly, um, you can't directly it, explain what it is. You can kind of explain what it isn't. Well, it isn't all those things. It isn't anything to be frightened of. It isn't anything that you should not surrender into because you're not ready for or you're going to burn in the fires of hell or something, which is many experiences I went through were like that. Oh, I can't, I can't. Oh, God, what's going to happen? Am I ready for it? Oh, no. What if I have this huge Kundalini experience and it goes up the wrong Nadi and I'm burning in hell for 19 years? Like, you know, Gopi Krishna, that book Kundalini, that freaked me out. So it's there's nothing to be frightened of whatsoever. But if it's an experience you're having that isn't repeatable and isn't constant, it isn't what you're looking for. If, if you're having all these wonderful massive experiences, which I did both in, in hallucinogenics and in meditation, I used to have all these really spectacular experiences, which, which probably mis, misled me for years. Um, but again, if there was anything that really seemed to be opening up in front of me, I used to resist and run away. And it was just that one day in the garden that I didn't. And then I realized that even after that, it's, it's only the first step. It's like a, ba a baby again. It's not that you're some great master or you know, you know everything. You actually realize that you know nothing. You've been so wrong about your essential nature that you were this brain stuck in a body having chemical reactions and electrical synapses and whatever. And it's nothing to do with that. It's nothing like that at all. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not what anybody was really expecting. Well, in terms of how people can, uh, and obviously each experience is as individual as the person concerned, although there may be some commonalities and, and things that come up again when people discuss their experiences. But in terms of what brings people often to this point um, is related to or can be related to the, the mind-body connection that we've discussed, the placebo effect in mainstream medicine or science is the one of the best examples you can explain to people about, you know, they will have heard of and that they, if not understand, they kind of know how it works. It's like something that in itself has no effect, somehow has an effect, but what's actually going on is it's not a sugar pill helping someone's body heal, it's the mind heal. So that connection is central to all of this. People sometimes find themselves, and as you did at one point, if their body begins to break down, they become ill. Quite often this is trying to tell them something, and it may be something simply about their diet and lifestyle. But in many cases, I would say that in itself is reflective of another aspect of themselves that perhaps needs to change or they need to look at. The mind suffers. The body cries out. We're being prompted here. It's an opportunity for growth. And beyond the physical, other types of crises or tipping points can quite often come up in people's lives when again they're being prompted to go through change and suppressed emotions we all know you mean whether it's ulcers or having a heart attack or something they can have a really profound effect on your physical body if you then connect the again at reapply the mind body connection here it's a totality it's a holistic picture for many people out there and i've met many people like this they're going through a phase in their life where things are going wrong whether it's in their relationships or in their work, or with their health, or with their finances, or sometimes all of these and more. And it seems obvious sometimes if you experience some of these things yourself, it's kind of like there's something here you need to look at. Otherwise, you will keep having these experiences again and again. Yes, absolutely. And <clears throat> for a couple of years after, <clears throat> after this happened to me, I thought... I'm absolutely fine. I'm done. That's it. And this is a mistake that almost everybody makes, I think, when it first happens. But you soon realize that it's really not the end of the road. It's, it's just the beginning. And although it doesn't really matter to the universe as a whole, whether you're in pain or ill or, or depressed or anything like that, you can you can look into these many different levels of things and unwind stuff. Like, I'm not being so clear here. When, when I was first trying to unwind this, this illness, when it hit me, I, I didn't think, I started to look much more at diet. I always thought I knew about diet as we got into in the last one, you know, about the whole ketogenic diet and 
light cycles and all, all that sort of thing was wonderful. But my big resistance was the emotional side. I thought, I've been this great yogi. I, I don't need any of that emotional balancing. I don't need to do all this looking into my past and seeing whether my mother upset me or my aunt spanked me or something like that. Because that's for kind of housewives who, who, who got this sort of craze. They found it in woman's own or something. I was just so arrogant about it. It was, it, I was completely wrong. When I started looking at that, I realized that you have this first initial awakening, which people generally, that's the point where with the people describe as an awakening. But the process of becoming a decent human being doesn't stop. I guess it can stop if you want, if, if nothing throws itself up in your face. I mean, there are, there are many people who have definitely had awakenings who go through some awful stuff or are actually pretty awful people. The stories of, um, of some of these gurus and the abuse they've given to their, their followers, you know, then they say, oh, this person wasn't awakened. Well, I, I have no way of judging that, but I wouldn't say they weren't because it's got nothing to do with that. It's got nothing to do really with the personality or anything like that. I think the personality blossoms <clears throat> post-awakening, depending on, on, on how interested you are to change and, and, uh, and grow. And if you're really idiotic, like me, you end up, you need a massive kick in the teeth to actually get up and do something. Because I'm tremendously lazy by nature. If I, if I can, uh, if I can lie down, I won't sit. And if I can sit down, I won't stand up. And I'm the same with, with things that I need to do. If I take the first, even practicing drums, which I absolutely love, I, it takes me ages to actually get there and do it. Once I'm there, I, I, I'm on a roll. It's that first step. <clears throat> so for me, the first step in, in balancing the emotions n never came until two years of horrendous agony in my joints, until I finally made the connection between what was happening in the joints and and the different emotions that I was dealing with. And there were a lot of things, sort of character flaws, um, stresses from the past, relationship problems, not with not with my partner, but but with my mother who 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 we were living with. There she was in our house and we were taking care of her, my 90-year-old mum. There was a lot of issues there. And and um, also something Something was very powerful for me, which was feeling that I needed to fix people. I, I'd already had a lot of success in reversing that the, the, the disease, and it was down to changing the diet and changing various things about my lifestyle that, that I'd been completely wrong about for years. And then I saw my friends, certain friends, getting very ill, and I thought, oh, I have to save them. Oh, they've got this autoimmunity, and they're still eating pizza and bread and stuff like that. I've got to sort them out. Well... It was funny. I st I started to unwind all these things that were niggling me with with techniques like EFT, emotional freedom technique, Byron Katie's the work. That's that's wonderful. And one day I was upstairs and I, I'd been really really working on this whole thing about having to save people. And suddenly, something which might seem tremendously obvious to somebody else. Um, but their things would seem tremendously obvious to me. We all have our, our, our blind spots. I suddenly realized it's none of my business. Such a simple concept. It's really none of my business to save anybody. If they ask, I'm happy to do, happy to help them out and give them lots of advice. If they don't ask, they're obviously not interested. And it was weird. It was, it was like the tiniest things can, can trigger the most extraordinary breakthroughs. And, I lay on the bed after that. In, in it was three hours of complete bliss that that this stress had shifted. I could feel the body just breathing a sigh of relief. And after that was another. I suppose you could call that another awakening. Not directly just because of not fixing people, but just because the heart opened. I think people say that after these awakenings, there's some point where it stabilizes and the heart opens. And and it did become that. It, I kind of fell in love with the whole world. And now. I still do exactly the same thing to somebody who was looking at my Facebook page, for example. I'm always banging on about this or that and answering people and discussing with it and having arguments with people. But it doesn't stress me out. I don't really care. I realize that it's just I am part of the, the, the computer that is the universe. And so is the person I'm conversing with, whether in person or, or, or online. 
And it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. I, I only do things because my heart tells me to do them. I don't do it because I think I need to save somebody. I talk about these things because it occurs to me. It goes in my head and I think, oh, well, I'll put that out there. That might be useful for somebody. And if it is, it is. If it isn't, it isn't. But I want to express it, so I do it. And this brings me to another misconception about awakening, that we, we, we lose desire. Desire is great. Desire, it, it shows us our path in life. If we go with our desires, we, we, we end up doing what we're supposed to be doing on this planet, in this incarnation. And it's, it's like that little chip in the computer has fixed itself so it can now work smoothly. Um, so yeah, desire, desire is, is the clue. You, you go with your desires. They're there for a reason. No need to stamp them out. I think, you know, religion always says we must stamp desire out. We must stamp this out. It's, it's, it's the wrong thing. Somebody's, Somebody's probably had an awakening experience in the past, and they told them over many Chinese whispers over many centuries that they don't have the same level of desire as they used to, so now just they think desire must be stamped out. It isn't. You still have the desire. It's not just a manic thing. You, you, you think, oh, I'd quite like this to happen, and so you put your focus on it. If it happens, it's great. If it doesn't happen, that's also great. You accept that too, because you can never tell how the universe is going to work out. You really can't. You, you, you can hope and you can put the desire out, but if it doesn't work out that way, it's absolutely fine too. And this takes away an enormous amount of stress. It takes away a huge amount of stress on the body if you can get to that state where it, it, it just doesn't matter so much what happens. Then people say, oh, well, you'll never do anything. You'll just be complacent. You'll just sit around. Well, if that's what you want to do and you want to wear a loincloth and sit up in the Himalayas, great, go for it. But most people don't. I think... There's a huge epidemic, uh, a domino effect, a popcorn popping effect of, uh, of people waking up these days. And it's, it's, it's widespread. It's in, it's in all society. It's not just people sitting up on hills wearing loincloths. It's surprising people have had these, have had these awakenings and they might be businessmen, bankers. They could be sportsmen. They could, they could be anything. It's, it's, there is nothing that stereotypes. A, 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 an awakened person we've come to believe that there is so we try and be like that bearded long-haired indian you know sitting on the sitting on the chair up in front of everybody else next to a bowl of flowers and that's that's the picture we've got and some of these western guys are adopting that or at least the people that hold the talks sit them on a chair and put some flowers up or something because they think they're supposed to be like that but no, there's some great people out there, some real sweary, shouty people, some real unconventional, rude people, and they're brilliant at a way of expressing how they've had awakenings. So, um, yeah, a lot of misconceptions about it, and once it happens, a lot of work to do, and sometimes nature forces you to do that work. It can be amplified, I think, um, after an awakening. It can be actually more uncomfortable than if you hadn't. I certainly think for every Eckhart Tolle or whoever, I mean, there's a, there's been a George Carlin or a Bill Hicks or somebody who's, um, uh. <laughs> you know, had a totally different slant on seeing a bigger picture. And I, I think there's, there's room for everything along the spectrum, really. Everybody's got their path and they're, they're hopefully on their way to doing what they feel they should be doing. And other people will identify or otherwise with what they're doing and, and get something out of it or not. Uh, so yeah, you're right. It's not just meant to be one, you know, one flavor. Yeah. And, and you can see this from, from something which I'm addicted to is the Buddha at the gas pump interviews, which uh, Rick Archer does from um, uh, Fairfield in Iowa. And they're wonderful. He just interviews these people who've had awakenings. Uh, I did one of them, but I've been such a fan of the show because I only discovered it afterwards because I wanted to find out why, what triggers it, what is it that brings it about? Because for me, it wasn't the 30 years of meditation. That, that I feel, almost led me in the wrong direction. Um, and after, after I, that, that awakening, I felt almost angry with any, all spirituality and, and awakening. My girlfriend meditates, and, and I used to, I say, what are you doing? What's the point? Don't you realize it's just a moment of surrender? I was stupidly arrogant again. It, it doesn't cure everything. It certainly doesn't. You can still be a complete plonker once it's happened. And, and so, you know, I, I, I searched down all those, all, all those routes. And, um, 
you could I was wondering did it do any good did this meditation do any good did it prepare me for it did it I, I think so I started listening to all these Buddha at the gas pump interviews just to hear people's stories and what emerges for me it is that there's really no one thing that that can cause it some of them are guys who've been Buddhist monks for 30 years and some guys are just you know, they're, they're, they're walking along in the garden and they step in a poo or something and, and, and they wake up. I mean, this, anything seems to trigger it. <clears throat> but three things, I think, came come out a lot, either in combination or one or two or three of them. And that is um, intense desire for it. Because you see a lot of people who learn to meditate <clears throat> or join spiritual movements, they do it mostly for the company, for, for the like-minded souls. They're not really absolutely focused on finding out what the truth is, and that's absolutely fine too. Um, but the people who seem to have these awakenings are the ones who are, are, are absolutely fascinated and one-pointed through whatever they do, of, 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 of always considering what it is, what is this that's going on here? That's the first thing, is the one-pointedness, the, the burning desire for it. And the second thing is is suffering. That seems to either come afterwards or come before and trigger the awakening or, or, or the stabilization of the awakening. It's very common for people to go through these dark nights of the soul or the body or both. And the third thing is surrender whether it's just surrendering to the absolute, surrendering to some kind of deity that they feel that they believe in, or surrendering to an illness, like like it was with me, really. There was there was more than one level of surrender. It wasn't just that time in the back garden of letting go of, 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 of being a, a conventional yogi. It was letting go of, of, of all kinds of things, the surrender into just life, the, the fact that, Every moment is spiritual pra practice. It's arrogant of us to say that sitting in lotus and chanting a mantra is 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 any more spiritual than 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 sitting on the bog and having a dump. It's it's all part of this exact same miracle. And the fact that we've considered one is more spiritual than the other is the complete misconception that stops us realizing. I think, in many cases, in many cases of spiritual people who get stuck, um, who get stuck in that certain stage. There was something that occurred to me, something that Rick Arch often says on, uh, on Buddha at the Gas Pump when he's trying to express this with people, that meditation is like a, a boat to get across a river. Once you get across the river, let it go and walk across the field or whatever. Now, I've always had the vision of, of, of meditators having rowed across the river and then they're just bumping against the bank. They're bumping against the opposite bank. Just turn around and get out of the boat. You don't need it anymore. There's some people hang on to it for too long. And like playing scales on a piano, eventually you've got to play some tunes. You've got to want to play a symphony. You, you don't want to just be playing scales all your life. But then one really wise, astute guy on Buddha of the Gospel, I forget who it was, when Rick mentioned that, he said, yeah, but what you wanted was on the other bank all along anyway. <laughs> and I think that was beautiful because it really was. We, we, you realize, I suppose, when you've walked across a field and then taken a boat and then got out and then banged against the other bank for a bit and then got out and walked across the other field, it's all the same thing anyway. It always was. But it doesn't matter. It's not like I'm complaining that there's anything wrong with spirituality because the computer is working exactly as it should. And I don't know whether everybody should be awoken. Well, they shouldn't be. I, I it, I don't. I don't see that that there's a lot of difference between somebody who's awakened and somebody who isn't. I, when you think of all the miracles that go on with the mind and the human body and the planet and our emotions and and, and relationships, just to realise that everything is all one organism and it's all going on at once is not really a massive step. It's it's really a very small step beyond what everybody's doing. So. It almost becomes taboo talking about awakenings because they go, who do you think you are? You'll find that a lot. In, I can't mention it to many people who are spiritually minded or in the TM movement because they just get angry. They, you, you get a reaction of, 
who the hell do you think you are? How, how could this happen to you? You haven't done enough meditation. You, all this sort of thing. Well, that's because I think a misconception of what it is. Because it's, when you, when you, when it happens, it wipes away all the spiritual ego. I was never very bad with it, but I, I used to often classify, oh, I'm a meditator and this person isn't. But now, I don't see any difference between somebody who's a meditator and somebody who isn't, like seeing the difference between someone who's black or white or somebody who's French or Spanish. It's, it's nonsense. It's proper nonsense. It's just labels that we put on ourselves. Once you see that it's all part of the same organism, such things become absolute lunacy. And so you, you, can, you can talk about it because it isn't such a great an, a, attainment that people would ever need to think who the hell do you think you are. But people still think that anyway because they don't have a concept of what it is. But it's lovely because it takes it away. Right and Nowadays, I would much rather be, be with somebody who is primarily just has a great non-serious vision of, 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 of life and has a tremendous sense of humor than somebody who is who is all into reading the, the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and sitting and meditating twelve hours a day. I can't I can't really identify with that spiritual mentality anymore because what I discovered was nothing to do with what again what I thought it was when I was one of those spiritual guys who read the Upanishads all day. So now, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd rather just t joke and talk about nonsense and, and have these great experiences. And, and you can get caught up in them again. You can get caught up in the world. But it, it, it isn't as serious as it was before. And underlying it always is the knowledge that whoever it is that you're standing in front of and joking with or even disapproving of, they're just you. They're just part of you. Not personally, but part of the whole computer. And... There's, there's, there's no more looking down on people. There's no more arrogance. There's no more of anything like that. The, 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 the character, the personality might, might still suggest that there is because it's, it's like stopping the engines on a ship. It doesn't stop straight away. Things, things sort of bend over the years and, and you have the same thoughts. You have everything the same as before, really. It's just in a completely different context and a wider context. Was it, I think Papaji or, or once said, somebody said, do you have the same thoughts as you had before your awakening? And he said, yes, of course I do. I just don't believe them anymore. And that's what it's like. Yeah, exactly. And I think that echoes what I was saying at the start, really, about a wider picture of something, uh, whether it's a, a totality of reality or whether just your own ego about just almost zooming out a little bit and seeing things a bit more accurately, you know, as, as how they really are, just an expanded view. And I think also part of what you've just been saying made me reflect on, you know, you had your experience with illness and being pushed to the brink more than once. And I said how important that can be um, as an indicator to people that there's something that they need to look at within themselves. Um, that, but for every Eckhart Tolle who might, someone like him who was pushed to the brink, to the end of his tether, to the point of taking his own life before he popped through to like something that ultimately was much better for him as an individual. Or on the other hand, someone like David Icke, who, for example, was kind of cruising along with a, a mainstream, success, materially successful life. Everything seemed to be going tickety boo, apart from his arthritis. So we just threw in, ironically, oh, and really? then, <laughs> and then suddenly he goes into some form of awakening, and his life has plunged into hell. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is what makes me laugh about you know people sort of. Um, and I'm I, as always, I'm not, I'm not pro or anti Ike here. I'm just using him as an example. People, oh yeah, Ike's doing it for the money. What a charlatan sort of thing. If he was doing it for the money, he'd have been much better sticking as a sports commentator and TV presenter. You know, he'd have done a lot better as he was doing. But the point of these couple of characters being was just the drama of it all, the tipping point of it all. And I notice, um, I've certainly come to know quite a few people and their experience of, if we want to keep using the term awakening, has been very incremental and gradual or very gentle or very simple, uh, certainly very non-violent, and it hasn't involved stress on their mind or body. It might have been they just, one day they just spent 
two minutes longer looking at a flower longer than they had any other day and suddenly they realise something. Or it's been a lifelong thing of just a very gradual opening up to something more expansive. Look, personally, I will just say I've always felt like I had a view of reality that when I was growing up felt very much askance at odds with a lot of people around me. I've never really changed that. It's just gradually expanded and I've never gone through any serious trauma really of any type, to be quite honest. I haven't. Physical, mental, emotional. I've had my moments, you know, but nothing that I can really say was like, oh my God, what an episode. But I just feel a gradual unfolding of a bigger picture. And I've noticed that a lot of people who other people have gone undergone different types of awakenings, whether very dramatic or whether gradual, are also coming to the same types of realizations. So from my own personal experience, I'm almost like if I did some kind of awakening, I, I don't know, maybe I did it in a former life or something, because I don't feel that I've actually had to really pay any sort of a price for a worldview that I feel comfortable in, if you see what I mean. I don't know if I can put that. I don't feel like I'm trying to get anywhere. I never have felt like I was trying to get anywhere, just to perhaps understand things a bit more, but I never lost any sleep over it. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I think that people who have these slow, gradual awakenings are probably basically far, far less of an idiot than I was. <laughs> I, I, it, it's, it's a natural process. It is to, to, to gradually awaken. But I, I think for me, I've always been a person of extremes. And so that's been reflected in everything. It's, it's, I'm just that type of computer chip in the whole computer and i accept that and i'm fine with it i i i have also i have times of gradual stuff where i look back a year it's like you said when before when we were talking about preparing for this interview and he said and and, and you said about um uh look back at stuff that you might have have, have changed in so i listened to that interview and there were a couple of things that that, that have changed or, or matured, and 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 I, I my perception of things is is very different. Although I can't, I haven't had any massive great leap of consciousness in between then and now. But if I look back and focus on then, I, I know that a lot of my insights are have refined a lot or changed a lot since then. Um, there's a law of diminishing returns. I think I went through a massive amount of change, so it is it is very gradual now. There's there's nothing that I said in 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 the last interview that I would disagree with, but just very subtly I can see how I can see deeper into things now, and that you don't really notice, and that's gra- that's probably natural how it's supposed to happen, but sometimes there are these big leaps as well. You see, I never sort of quantify oh have i had more of an awakening than somebody else i mean this is an absolutely ridiculous thought to have because it's it's nothing to do with that it's it's to do with the whole computer working as one um so the gradual awakenings yes i think that's probably really how it's supposed to happen naturally i i think that the sudden awakenings are often when you've been really down the wrong path and and then suddenly you realize it's like when you go down, you say you've gone 50 miles the wrong way down the motorway. You really feel it more than going 50 miles in the right direction when you, when you realize how far you've gone. So, yeah, I, I don't think having a great spectacular awakening is, is, a, is a particularly impressive thing at all. It's just that that's what happened to me because that's the type of personality I am. So I get these sudden realizations where I've been a bit of an idiot before. I have it in all sorts of things, in, in my relationships with people, in my own emotional makeup. I have so much work to do, and I still have so much work to do. And in, in, in my playing of drums, even, I suddenly discover something that probably every other drummer has known for 30 years. And it suddenly revolutionizes my playing. And I go shouting about it. Whoa, have you discovered this? And some people have and some people haven't. Some people go, oh, yeah, I do that anyway. I never really thought about it. And others go, wow, that's brilliant. And, and, and I'll try it. Or, God, haven't you realized that yet? Or, you know, there's all sorts of different reactions. And people get from A to B in very different ways. And all of them are valid. Again, you've, you've, you've hit on something there, the stereotype of the big awakening. Okay, I had one. But that doesn't mean to say that anybody who hasn't had one 
has any less perception than I do, or that their path to that perception is any less valid. It's, it's, we can never tell what's going to happen. I just seem to be one of those people who, who, for whom everything's extreme. Maybe it's my Gemini nature. I don't know. It's one side and the other. Taking into account, or and to some extent, despite uh, a lot of what we've said so far about the role of illness in awakening or in uh, pointing to areas in our lives that need attention, the mainstream perspective, generally speaking, is to obviously be at war with disease, even to the point of demonizing disease now there's some terrible diseases out there of of the body and of the mind and we will all know if we as individuals haven't suffered from one ourselves we may well do we'll certainly know people close to us and to some extent who have and it may cost them their sanity or indeed their lives with uh you know with things like cancer for example so when you're in the midst of all that personally um whether it's yourself or whether it's you know friends relatives loved ones it can be a, a quite a maelstrom of emotions and all sorts of things coming up never mind physically trying to deal with it can we get through this what does it mean if it looks like the end of someone's existence a lot of stuff to deal with there so i'm trying to just set that aside and think about our collective response to these things and i always had a little bit of um how can i put it i'd always have a little bit of concern when i would see from the earliest i can remember campaigns against epidemic illnesses and cancer for example on the increase has been for a long time now and a lot of people point to environmental factors particularly diet uh, other similar things that you know the sort of the great soup of toxins that we live in these days and every time i see a campaign against cancer uh, some kind of new awareness thing or a particular type of cancer. And what they're basically saying, what it boils down to quite often is fuck cancer. And of course, you'll see fuck cancer memes on social media. And maybe I've just got the luxury of being able to reflect on this without being directly affected. But I'm thinking, well, the cancer, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, the cancer is part of you, actually. There may be cells that are performing in an aberrant way, uh, but they're doing what they do, whether it's on the, the micro level of the individual human body or on the macro level of things happening in our, our larger systems, such as the environment, such even as the economy. Let's not forget that's a system, a human system as well, is our tendency to make all these enemies out of these things that are going wrong a way of us trying to turn away from or be blind to things that we need to pay attention to. Well, it's a symptom of being stuck in a small ego, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, we're terrified of the ego dissolving. So one of the big turning points in my healing was when one day I finally did accept it and say, I have to be happy. I mentioned this in the last interview. I'm listening to it again, but, um, I have to be happy despite this illness, even if it goes on forever. And at that point, it really started to shift. So I, I think what awakening gives you is a, a compassion, not only for people, but for the illness. <laughs> it, gives you, it gives you a compassion for the fact that the universe is creating these illnesses because it's creating them to, for some kind of reason. I'm in the business now, I suppose, of helping people through them. But that doesn't mean to say I think that they're tremendously evil. I look at somebody who's really suffering and, and my heart really goes out to them. But at the same time, not only do I trust that that's the right thing, but I'm also quite excited for them that they're going to start on this amazing journey if they get the right mind space together. And they're going to come out better than they went in. I said something I was talking about the other day, a talk I did, um, about the myth of the cure. You know, there's, there's this idea that I think this is really important for people who are ill. And, and that is that they, they want to be cured. They, oh, go away, get, get, get off me. This awful, dreadful disease and oh, God's neglected me and it's all, oh, all this awful stuff. So the, the, we want, we want to, at that stage when we're newly diagnosed with suffering, we want to go back to the person we were before we had this disease. Oh, I need to be cured. 
So there's this myth of the cure. There's going to be a complete return to where you were. Now, this never happens. It never happens. Um, you know, if you sprain an ankle or something, great, the ankle heals up. We're not talking about stuff like that. It's stuff that really puts you through the ringer. It's So you don't go back to where you were, but you can come out far better than you went in, far more evolved, far more... Um, knowledgeable, far more peaceful in yourself, far more accepting of everything, and far more prepared to deal with future problems, even though you might have certain scars of stuff. Like some people listen to me and they think, okay, I had arthritis, now it's completely reversed. Well, no, it's not quite like that. What, what it is, is that, yes, I was in tremendous agony for a while, and I had niggling things for many years before, so I brought them down, I brought all the symptoms down massively to 10% or 5% of what they were with diet, cold thermogenesis, lifestyle tweaks, getting rid of Wi-Fi, artificial light, all these environmental things. You can bring the symptoms right down. But once it's going on, it'll probably stay ticking over. Then you've got to look at the emotional side of things. And the body is a great map for for the emotions. So... For example, when I figured out problems with my mum and, and, and whatever, the, the ankles completely healed up. And then uh, another thing that was going on with me, the wrist healed up. Now, that's been niggling me since early 90s. It was never actually properly diagnosed. But I can see trends that went back to then. And, and all these things that happen. So now there are parts of my body that are better than when I was 20. There's a left knee that's still swollen because the synovial membrane got stretched and, 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 and there's more fluid able to be in that knee than there was. I don't know if it'll ever look right again. Maybe it will. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't hurt anymore. Um, it sort of tingles if I eat the wrong thing, but it doesn't doesn't bother me. But there's definitely some, some joint damage there, although other joints that were much worse have completely gone back to normal, which is supposed to be impossible. Um, so, yes, it's not a cure as such. It's an ongoing process, and I don't know, one day maybe a kidney will explode or something, and, and then I'll have to deal with that, and maybe I'll end up with one kidney and a far better kidney on the other side. I don't know. You know, you never know what's going to happen, but they're all lessons. They're all so welcome when they come, after you've had a few and seen where they take you. I look at my knee now, and I used to think, that's gruesome, that's disgusting, doesn't that look awful? And now I look at it, and I think, I just... It's a kind of chuckle, and I think that's a cool battle scar. And actually, I, I'm pretty sure I know what it relates to now. There's the, I have, I, I've always had a very easy life financially, and knees are to do with moving forward in life, and I'm at the mo moment now where, you know, I'm 54 years old, and, and 55, actually, I can hardly count anymore. And, and I, have, uh, I have a young family of an 8-year-old and a 2-year-old, and, and the money that I had has run out, and, and so now I've got to figure out what to do in life. And there's a very a, a big crossroads here. I... I a lot of people were at this position that I'm, I'm in now when they were 18 or so. I never really got finances together. And that's my next big adventure. That's my next big hurdle. But now I look at it and I think that knee's probably never going to look perfect and really go back to normal until I have those finances sorted. I've turned the volume of it down to 2% of what it was, but it's still there. And so I, I need to look at the emotional cause of that. And I'm, I know that and I'm working on it. That's my next phase of 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 healing but yes my my body is in a better shape altogether than it was when i was 30 so healing is you know you never quite go back you just go forwards and forwards and some things go faster than others i've completely sorted my liver out there was a fatty liver with cysts in it that's completely healed i had kidney stones they're they're, they're sorted out rosacea boiling up and and, and get overheating that's completely sorted out there was there were tons of things, and so yes, you you change and and uh, something and these symptoms drop away as as you figure out the actual causes, the root causes of them, and taking it down with the lifestyle changes to a to a level where you're not suicidal with the pain allows you to to listen to that. But to be honest, I I, I could have listened if I'd have been a little bit brighter. I could have listened to all of this when I was thirty, when the whispers were there just a little bit. But I didn't listen because often we don't until we're in screaming agony because we're not taught that way. We don't have 
a, a shaman in the village that we can go to and say, I've, I've got this little tingle in my knee and I had a bit of a bad dream about a mongoose eating my eyeball or something. And, and he'll interpret that and work with you. But in our culture, you go to the doctor and you say that, you're, you're liable to get, uh, to get dragged off to a loony bin or something, or at least thrown out and told to come back when your leg's hanging off. So it, we're not taught to think in that way. But now I do think in that way. If I get a little niggle, I, I, I really listen to it, and I'm excited. I'm not worried. I don't sort of get a pain and think, oh, oh, oh I've got cancer, like I did before, this fear of this awful disease that's been built up to be this dreadful thing, you know, fuck cancer, like you say. So it, it's, it's not a fear anymore. It's, it's a lovely instrument panel that you can get used to. So this is the myth of the cure. You're not going to cure. You're not going to get cured. You're going to move forward. You might be even better. But don't think of going back. People always pine for the past. You got to be hope for the future, maybe, and, and and or accept the future, rather, whatever that may be, and just do your best in the present to listen to what it is your body's telling you. Modern, modern medicine will always give us uh, something to 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 squash the symptom to, to that stops that process. It takes away the magic of illness as well as not actually curing it. Well, just a little thought that popped up there. Uh, you're mentioning uh, being dragged off to the loony bin by medics um, or section as we call it <laughs> in this country um, there would be something for us to reflect on there in terms of mental illness or psychiatric disorders and how many people have been stuck in a rubber room carted off to the funny farm when in fact something within them has been trying to awaken and change but they've just been the people around them society or the establishment didn't know how to to deal with them, that's certainly something that's uh, probably a subject for another day, but, you know, worth reflecting on. No, I think I think that's really relevant to me as well, because um, I, th- I remember seeing a, a, an article a while ago, what a shaman sees in a, in a mental institution. And there's a guy, oh, I forget his name, uh, Ger- Gerson, Robert, Robert Gerson. Have a look for some time, if anybody's listening to this and, and, and they feel that they have some kind of... Um, awakening that's perhaps quite uncomfortable and they don't know what to do about it. There's, there's a guy interviewed on Buddha at the Gas Pump and, and he, since the 70s, since he had a big awakening, and he's been helping people who have had awakenings but people have th- thought that they've gone mad. And, and he can kind of distinguish between the two. And and he goes and helps them out, you know, and, and, and helps them to realize that this is actually a very... Uh, um, a very positive thing rather than some kind of mental disorder they've got. I mean, two weeks after I took my last massive mushroom trip, I was hitching back from Wales and, and, and I had an experience like that in the car where it was definitely an awakening, but I completely resisted it because I was at my, my, almost at a cellular level that the, the teetering, not quite good, not quite bad tripping had told me to, re- taught me how to resist everything. So I naturally freaked out, oh, my God, I'm going down the abyss again, or oh, what's happening, oh, you know, all of that sort of thing. And it left me with two years of proper psychosis because every morning I'd wake up and it was kind of okay and then it would creep in, oh, no, I just remembered, oh, I'm actually insane now, oh, no, oh, oh yes, I've ruined myself with hallucinogenics, all of that sort of thing. And it was just a matter of not surrendering. I, now, I don't, I, I'm not going to be glib and say that everybody who's on antidepressants can just suddenly surrender and they'll be fine. I, I, I really don't know. That's not my, my business to say that. But for me, it was. It was, I can see now that it was just was really resisting. And I, I, I went to a, well, my father dragged me along to a psychiatrist, sort of Harley Street one, and, and, and he prescribed a load of medication, which I never took. I thought, well, drugs have got me in this mess. I'm not going to take any drugs to get me out. Um, and it, it, it was with me full force for a couple of years and and for a long time after that probably 30 years i remember thinking at the time this is going to come back when i'm 50 or so but it did come back but in the form of the arthritis in, in a form that i didn't even consider because things come from the subtle to the gross if we don't listen to the mental aberrations they become physical aberrations and eventually if we don't listen to that we just die because we we've we've got to figure out as you say you get the same lesson over and over again but it comes in different forms it was exactly the same lesson but i didn't recognize it as such in 2010 when i got ill like it was only three years later or so when i was, I was on my way out of it that i thought oh hang on this is what i thought was going to come back 
back when I was 18. And I thought, this is going to come back when I'm 50, even if I get rid of it, that pessimistic thought. Well, it did. But it was much more into the cellular level. It was much more gross by then. Um, but it was all part of the same process. So, yeah, the fear of the, of, of the disease, it, 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 it creates really the wrong, the, the wrong environment for healing from the start. Well, with what you were just saying, uh, or reiterating again that you'd mentioned earlier about the movement of these phenomena, in some case symptoms from the subtle realm to the gross. If we then tie that in with what you were saying about the unity of everything, you know, within our own bodies and within the wider reality, I think in certain circles today, there's a lot written about that, whether it's from the more uh, out there outre uh, end of quantum physics through to all manner of spiritual writings, all is one. And for a lot of people, it's kind of like, yeah, 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 I've heard it all before. Sounds lovely. So what? Look out the window, look on the TV. What effect is it having? Well, for me, that's not to actually dismiss any of that at all. It's just simply to say, well, yeah, exactly. So therefore, there's something here we need to look at. And it's powerful because I think people want to take whether it's ancient spiritual teachings indicating the wholeness of everything, you know, the common source of everything, whatever it happens to be, even at its more conservative end, what quantum physics might be saying about the underlying nature of our physical reality, it's always, it applies, that's interesting, it's in this book, it's in that documentary, it was in that talk on that radio show, but then, meanwhile, we'll get back to doing exactly what we were doing, more of the same, and oh, everything's dysfunctional and falling apart. There's nothing, but there's nothing for us to learn from the rest of this. And of course, there is, and as you just said a moment ago, we'll keep having these experiences again until we take a forward step. Yeah. Well, as, as for it being sort of incomprehensible and, and useless to, to, to people, that, yes, it is. It's, I can't, I can't pretend that it is. I love talking about it. I love trying to explain it, which you can never quite do. It's you know, it's like trying to catch smoke. It, it, you 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 can't do it. And I I'm quite aware that a lot of people who listen to me who are interested in the diet stuff and the and the, and the lifestyle stuff that I go on about would would sort of listen to this interview and go, like, what the fuck's he on about now? Because it's it's something that's totally irrelevant to most people. But that's okay because that is fine. That's what's going on. When 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 you see that the whole computer's working as it should, there's no distinction between people who who are really interested in talking about this and people who think it's madness. It's it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me whether somebody's interested in what I'm saying or whether they think I'm a lunatic. It's 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 not a concern anymore at all. It was for a little while, even after it, where the ego is sort of going, oh, uh, I can't mention that, or people will think I'm, I'm, I'm mad or, or, or pretending or, or something like that. But it, it, I think it's, it's great that people are coming forward and talking about it now in their own way and, and in so many different ways that they've experienced it. And if somebody's not interested, well, that's cool too. And it doesn't make them any less evolved than somebody who's who's really thinking about it all the time because they have their own path in life. And a lot of people, if they really experience this, might not be able to do that path in life that is so incredibly uh, valuable for the whole. How many people who are doing massive amounts of change and campaigning for this and that, maybe if they realize this, they, they wouldn't do that anymore. And they've just followed their desire. It just it just happens that my des my greatest desire has been to find this out, and I found it the moment I stopped looking. <laughs> Whereas I have all sorts of other desires, like you know, to help people out with their autoimmune conditions, or to play drums really nicely, or <clears throat> to catch the biggest carp in my local carp lake, and stuff like that. You know, I I to see my kids grow up well, to do to do that, but once once I think you've had that, sometimes I kind of almost wish in a way it hadn't happened because I might be a bit more dynamic in, in pursuing what I want. But then I realize that's nonsense too because that's just the ego thinking that we have any control over what happens. Do we? Do we even have any control over any of this? Was it anything I did at all? Probably not. 
I think everything just happens to us. There's something that the scientists have realized now where um, you move your arm and they realize that the, the, the signal's gone to the arm before you've even made the thought. I, I don't know how they've timed this, but there's something like that. And, and you realize that there's stuff going on that we'll never understand, whether we have any free will whatsoever, which when somebody's completely caught in the ego, they just go, oh, you've lost me now. I might have listened to the rest of it, but I'm not listening now. That we're, we're, we're just part of the organism, and, and the, 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 thing, the thought that we have any free will at all is a complete illusion. Or the fact that time's even linear. That do we have, you know, we don't know what happened, the Big Bang. We don't know where it's all going. We, we don't even know why we're here. We don't know anything, really. And so all these scientists pretend that they know everything. And now the quantum physicists are, are realizing that there's just monstrous stuff going on that we have no idea about whatsoever. But it's quite obvious that we have no idea what's going on. And we're not supposed to. The only way that we'd know that is if we were the everything all at once but we're not we're just an eye or an ear or a finger we are just the sense organs of the infinite so there's no point worrying about the fact that we don't know everything or 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 thinking that we know better than somebody else or our path in life is better than somebody else it, it's it's not at all it's uh it's a very humbling experience for it to happen and yeah, most people won't be interested. It's totally irrelevant to them. But if it happens, there are some tremendous benefits, of course. Um, maybe not in the field of making massive amounts of money and being incredibly dynamic and <laughs> and having a life path because you can't take anything particularly seriously. But if it happens, it happens. You know, uh, Eckhart Tolle has been rambling on about it for years, and I'm sure he's not short of a bob or two. Again, it depends on what your particular path in life is. He, he, the computer obviously had that in mind for, for the sense organ that's called Eckhart Tolle. And so that's absolutely perfect for him. And the person who has an awakening, an awakening and never even mentions it even to their wife uh, for the rest of their life, that's absolutely fine too. All of it is fine. So, um, yeah, it is completely irrelevant to, to most people, although what they don't realize is that they are part of that whole thing all the time anyway. Yeah, whether they like it or not. And this does kind of finally give the lie to the idea of a of a, a big awakening being a destination and that you'll get there, there will be somewhere for you to be and that will be it. You finally arrived, Godhead, whatever happens, it, it happens to be with an all-seeing knowledge of the who, why, when, where and how of life, the universe and everything where, as in fact, all that ever happens if you're lucky, if you push through some barrier or other, in your mind or wherever it happens to be, is that the mystery deepens. The mystery just deepens and deepens and deepens. Science tells us this. Um, spirituality tells us this. Um, even exploration of our, our bodies in the physical world and what's really behind it tells us this. And I frankly, last thought for me, I frankly love the idea that I've got no idea what the hell's going on, you know, but it's fascinating just to wonder about it. Yes, it is. I often wonder how people can't. I mean, to me, it's been so fascinating to find something new that you have absolutely no idea about. I love having no idea about something because there's all this wonderful stuff to, to, to discover. When I come across somebody who's really close minded, it's such a weird thing for me. I don't, I don't understand how they, it can happen. And it seems to happen to the people who have the narrowest fields of knowledge. They've not really, really taken an interest in the universe and studied anything. They've just seen what's in the paper, this and that, which, again, is absolutely fine because they're probably doing exactly what they're supposed to do, exactly as the computer has intended for them to do. But it's difficult with my personality to understand a concept like that of being really close-minded. People who are utterly, utterly sure on any point whatsoever. I, I just think that... Um, like I said to somebody earlier on today, the, the one thing that I've discovered really for sure in my life is that nothing is quite what it seems. Wonderful. Well, Phil, tell folks about your website, about your book, which is still available, and in closing, anything else that you'd like to share? No, I think we've covered a lot. You asked some great questions and got some good stuff out of me that kind of surprised me too. So that it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, if anybody's um, interested in finding out more, if anybody would like to um, chat about anything, I do Skype consultations from my website, which is at pureactivity.net. 
I'm really happy to chat to anybody. I learn an awful lot from these people who I chat to, really. I mean, they, they've been such an education to me. They're brilliant, their stories, as they unfold and seeing them healing and ideas that they come back with. So that's a real privilege. The, the book is, is still available on Amazon Kindle. And um, there's, there's all the links from that website at pureactivity.net. So pop in if you like, and I'll, I'll be really happy to chat. Splendid. Well, Phil. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. You're so welcome, Greg. Thanks for asking me again.